Hello, my name is Steve Wendell and I'm one of the local historians here in Anamosa. I want to talk to you today about a special place in Anamosa. A place that's been here now for 150 years. A place rich with human stories. A place rich with architectural detail. A place unique in Iowa. The place I'm talking about is this place behind me, the Anamosa State Penitentiary. I don't mean to sound biblical, but in the beginning, there was the stone. And uh, in no small part, the prison was located in Anamosa because of the uh, deposits of world-class limestone that exist in this area. In fact, just a few miles from here is a little uh, suburb of Anamosa called Stone City. And uh, of course, they have made, th their whole name is based on uh, their uh, proximity to the limestone, which is being quarried to this day and shipped all around the world. So uh, basically, Iowa needed a new prison. Fort Madison, um, the territorial prison at Fort Madison, uh, was built before Iowa it was even a state, uh, and it was overcrowded. It was the late 1860s. It was time to expand, and there was a competition among a variety of Iowa communities for the prestige that would go along with the location of a new uh, facility. Uh, the whole eastern part of the state, the northern part of the state was abuzz because Fort Madison was located in the south. They wanted the uh, new facility to cover the north half of the state and uh, Anamosa won the day in no small part due to its proximity to existing rail and limestone. Now this is uh, the prison quarry that you're seeing there. Uh, this was donated to the state. Uh, that was also an inducement that helped the folks in Des Moines, the lawmakers, decide that it would be cool to locate the place in Anamosa. Plus we had a very, very persuasive champion in the legislature at the time. Then the uh, challenge, of course, uh, was uh, converting this into this. So how do you do that? <laughs> well, you have some very, very smart people that uh, do uh, know how to do blueprints, and you have a ready workforce of uh, inmates who will eventually, over the course of the next 60 years, build a prison around themselves and turn it into this uh, castle on the prairie. Uh, this stone citadel, which has, uh, will still be there just like the place of Fort Madison. You know, what do you do with an old stone prison? I mean, you know, it's going to be there forever and ever. Uh, but they just don't build them like this anymore. And uh, uh, this, of course, was in the days before cement uh, concrete was even invented. Uh, and so all they had was the stone. And uh, they had to convert that stone into this... Uh, um, uh, magnificent edifice. They, they started with a small stone building that they created with hired uh, help because they didn't have inmates yet. And then in May of 1873, the first 20 convicts were shipped up from Fort Madison. And uh, they were uh, to be the uh, uh, first uh, workers in terms of building the prison. So they uh, began the process of quarrying the stone. They used, they had no, no electricity in those days. They just had these things they called, uh, these were derricks, they, they called them gin pole cranes. They were able to, uh, using steam power, uh, winch around these massive stone blocks that they, would, uh, that they would quarry. And they would be brought by rail. They created a rail a spur line that came directly into the prison uh, and would go to the, uh, uh, Stone, they called it the stone shed, and it was located at various points around the yard, depending on where their work focus was at the time. Uh, this shows what a mess the inside of the institution was for many decades, uh, because uh, you just can't build a place like that without uh, creating a bit of a ruckus. And so uh, this is uh, illustrative of that. Pretty much every stone that you see uh, in the building of this place was fashioned by hand. 
yes, it was uh, cut, a rough cut um, uh, at the quarry and then further shaped when it came inside. But then they would take those massive blocks and they'd put them up on these big saw horses. The inmates would use their chisels and hammers and they would shape that darn thing. No electricity, no nothing. In fact, the stone shed was long. They had inmates working in two rows uh, with the rail line going right in between them. Uh, here they are coming back from working at the quarry. They just uh, brought them back in uh, via a, uh, a rail car, just like that. You notice that they are wearing the stripes. That was still in the days when they did that. And so they would bring them into the stone shed, which in the wintertime, by the way, was very, very cold. Uh, they had one, maybe two stoves, maybe one at either end. But if you were stuck in the middle, you had very little, very little warmth. And uh, there was a specific process you had to do in order to uh, request permission to come from the guard to come up and get warm. But otherwise, you just worked with cold hands cold feet, work in the stone day in and day out. There you can see the guard standing uh, close to the warm stove uh, and the, uh, he's got a little rail around him. Uh, he would, uh, when it was the end of the day, he would take his uh, nightstick and he would rap on that rail and it made a very distinctive sound and all chisels and hammers, then all noise ceased. That endless chip, chip, chipping that you heard throughout the day ceased. And then they would uh, march uh, lockstep, lockstep to d supper, tired as hell. Uh, lockstep was a means of moving inmates around the yard that kept them uh, in line, uh, in control. Uh, they would put their right hand on the right shoulder of the man in front of them. They would coordinate their gait I imagine for new inmates coming in, it was intimidating because they would probably miss that step, kick the guy in front of them and get a, a, a few choice words shouted in their, directions and, uh, their direction. Uh, it was an uh, uh, odious thing. Uh, the inmates hated it. And uh, during the prison reform movement in the first part of the 20th century, oh, around 1907, somewhere around there, it was abolished, much to the joy of the detained. So anyway, one of these stories I like to tell about construction is that of uh, a fellow by the name of Texas Bill. Texas Bill uh, was a drunken brawler uh, who was a real hell raiser. So he ends up arguing with and shooting and killing his boss over 75 cents. He was sentenced to life in prison and he was incarcerated at Anamosa and Overnight, the drunken wild man disappeared. And he became a docile, an integral part of the building of the Anamosa prison. He, probably more so than any other inmate, touched virtually every stone that you see in any picture of the Anamosa prison. Uh, despite the fact that he had uh, kind of, kind of semi-tubercular lungs, he had lung problems, and of course, in nowadays, we would avoid putting an inmate uh, in that classification because of medical reasons. We would avoid putting them in a dusty environment, but back in those days, you know, he was assigned to the stone shed. That's where we needed help. That's where he had to go, and so here he is in a dusty environment, and uh, it aged him very, very quickly. Um, in fact, they were calling him Old Dilly when he was in his late 40s, early 50s. In fact, he died at age 51. Uh, he, in many ways, he probably gave his life for the building of the prison. I, I really think that's true. Uh, the environment he worked in hastened his death. But he not only became a master craftsman of the stone, uh, he taught the craft to uncounted numbers of other inmates uh, who carried on uh, for him. He was revered by staff and inmates alike. It, it, it was a remarkable transformation of a man from someone who had no, uh, no direction, uh, no, no compass, and uh, who, who now, uh, the prison gave him that, the construction of this place gave him that. So at any rate, uh, the end of the story is that he, uh, he uh, died at age 51. They had a uh, service in the chapel in which uh, the way they describe it, 
hardened men wept openly at the sight of their fallen comrade that they knew and loved so well. This is the back, what you're seeing now is the back end of the chap, the prison chapel, and that ornate uh, window there, that stained glass surrounded by that ornate uh, stonework was all done by hand by Dilly. And his casket lay underneath there in the chapel uh, while they had the service. And of course, the next step would be for him to be buried in uh, the prison cemetery, Boot Hill. Uh, but his his friend, uh, uh, Major Gill, decided that uh, he wanted something a little better for him. And so he put in a claim for his body. And he and uh, some of the other long-term inmates chipped in funds and bought him a plot in the city cemetery in Anamosa, feeling that he should... Uh, he should have a, a better place than, than just the convict cemetery. And one of the uh, men that he had taught the stone craft to uh, was set to work to uh, create a fitting stone, a fitting tribute to his comrade. And this is that stone, still very legible, still very readable uh, in Riverside Cemetery. He's actually buried just a stone's throw from where Grant Wood is. <laughs> 